Thank you, Lonnie. I really appreciate uh, all of you being here. Um, Earth Day is a very special time uh, for a lot of us. Uh, and I am really grateful for the opportunity to show you all uh, what we're doing uh, right in your neighborhood. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this talk will be um, a call to action uh, to all of you, because what I'd like to do is show you um, not just uh, from a, a global warming or an Earth Day perspective what we should be doing, but I'm, I'm going to show you today what we've decided to do uh, and the project that we've been working on now for the last five years and, um, and how you might be able to, uh, to help us um, launch this project. So first of all, uh, I'm the president and CEO of an organization, a nonprofit organization that I started about 10 years ago called CHIRP, which started off educating cities and counties on the power and benefits of energy efficiency. I spent 30 years uh, running my architecture and construction company here in Claremont, Hartman Baldwin Design Build. And along the way, um, in around 2003, I discovered that buildings were the largest contributors to the proliferation of greenhouse gases on the planet because there are so many buildings needing so much energy and the energy supplying to those buildings uh, were mostly fossil fuels. So that shocked me. Um, and as I was getting ready to uh, retire and sell my company in 2010, I decided to pivot and focus the rest of my life on working on solving global warming issues in the building sector. So five years ago, I met uh, a man, uh, an inventor named Kent Kernahan, who had also been working on a similar uh, mission um, as an engineer and an inventor. And he had stumbled upon a solution to a fundamental problem in solar panels today and solved that problem. So we joined a, a partnership uh, to uh, deploy solar in a different way. So the thing that we all know especially those of us that are interested in Earth Day, is that the warnings have been dire and um, glaring uh, for a long time. I have a friend here in Claremont uh, who's uh, 95 this year and, and held one of the first conferences in the world in, in 1971 on the environmental uh, catastrophe that's looming. We all know that we've got uh, about 10 years to make um, significant change. And so really the question is for all of us, how serious are we? Uh, we now know when we see with uh, what's happening with uh, Corona that lots of major and dramatic change is possible if we all put our minds to it and decide to do that. So the question now is what are we going to do? And so I decided uh, that I was going to focus all of my efforts on doing a small project in Claremont and in Pomona that could make the biggest difference that I could imagine for, for myself. So we know that we've got a big challenge ahead of us. Um, you know, this is, this is an old trope in some ways, uh, but we know that during World War II, in 1939, we were only producing 3,000 airplanes a year, and by the end of the the war, we were producing 3,000 a day. That kind of scaling up is possible if we all put our minds to it. So we're going to be talking about solar panels today and renewable energy. And I love this quote by Bill McKibben saying that solar panels are not just a Hogwarts level magic, but they redress the balance of power. And normally um, in a lecture, I would ask people what that means and to have a little dialogue about that. But I think you can all imagine that um, the, the seed of power for so long uh, has been uh, with the fossil fuel companies and ha they have been resisting change uh, to say the least. Uh, and now uh, with the advent of solar panels and with the advent of the panels that we will now be producing, we will literally be able to redress the balance of power and have every city be able to produce their own solar panels in their own factory with their own labor. So we're going to open the first nonprofit solar panel assembly factory in the world right here in Pomona. 
We just got given a $2.1 million grant from the state of California to open that factory because our assemblyman believed and the state legislature believes that it's a good idea uh, to be able to bring back millions of middle-class manufacturing jobs and address global warming. In California, as you all know, we are living in a very rich legislative environment in California that supports these kinds of initiatives. The first thing we're going to tackle, of course, is working on halting global warming. We're going to bring back middle-class manufacturing jobs because that's been one of the problems in our economy uh, over the last 60 years. We're going to do that by stimulating local economies. And we're doing that under the nonprofit business model and we're doing that by creating local businesses, not taking venture capital money and sucking profits out of local communities, but using resources in local communities to recirculate those dollars as many times as possible. And we're also focused on halting environmental justice. Uh, many people now uh, completely understand the connection between fixing global warming and addressing our environmental injustice issues in this country. The, the two are inextricably tied, not only just because of the environmental degradation to our poorest neighborhoods in the country and in California especially, but also because if we do not address the economics of the lower middle income classes, we will never be able to disseminate and engage and disseminate solar and dis, and engage the the all of the people in a community necessary to fight these problems. So here's the vision, real quickly. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the numbers of what these factories will produce, because this factory in Pomona is only the first one. We've designed it to be replicable in disadvantaged communities throughout California and the United States. So the first factory and the first phase of the first factory, which is to deploy 6,000 solar systems on 6,000 low to middle income households. That will mitigate 26,700 metric tons of CO2 per year, which is the equivalent of driving around the world about 2,300 times in an automobile. And that's just the first phase of the first factory. We're going to create 763 direct and indirect jobs. We're going to stimulate the local economy by $147 million in the first 15 years of operation. And we're going to affect the lives of 6,000 low to middle income households. So here's the formula. Listen to this formula. If we put solar systems on 6,000 low to middle income households, those households utility bills will drop by on average 80 to $90 a month. You take 6,000 household times 80 to $90 a month times 12 times 30 years, you get, get $6.5 million a year increase in disposable personal income at the lowest household income level. So we're diverting six and a half million dollars a year that's currently going to the utilities to be burned up every month directly back into the local economy where we know that low to middle income households, since they've never satisfied their essential spending needs, will spend that extra disposable personal income on essential spending needs such as clothes, food, food, gasoline, medical supplies, school supplies, and rent. So this is the, the quickest way to stimulate the local economy, which uh, the, uh, the government right now understands. It's why they're sending checks to every household. So we're gonna take that factory and then we're going to multiply it by 10 in two years. So you can take all of the first numbers, multiply it by 10, and suddenly this starts to get very interesting from a scalability perspective, creating over 7,000 jobs 
and starting to stimulate local economies in California in the billions of dollars, affecting 60,000 low income households. So that's our vision. That's what we've been working on for five years. And um, I'm happy to say that we've uh, just ordered uh, machinery this month uh, from China. Some of the best machinery in the world right now is being made in China and we're going to flip the, the equation. China has, we've been selling our intellectual property to China and they have been uh, sucking up all the jobs from the United States and producing panels. We're going to purchase machines from China and create all the jobs here and keep our intellectual property in the United States. And it can only be licensed to nonprofits in local jurisdictions. So how are we going to do this? You need a strategic advantage in order to start a new company. We're going to deploy, number one, the, the most advanced solar panel in the world. And I will talk about that a little bit. Number two, we're going to do this deploying a nonprofit business model called a social enterprise. We're going to be focusing on the idea called in economics called the new localism, uh, focusing on regenerating capital at the local level. And we're going to address environmental injustice and poverty as our first market deployment strategy. All right, so the most advanced technology in the world. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. In 1905, Einstein formulated and put an equation to the law of the photoelectric effect. In 1940, in fact, in, in fact, I mean, it's interesting to know that the only Nobel Prize that Einstein got was for the law of the photoelectric effect, not for equals MC squared or any of his other, uh, other work that he is famous for. So from 1905 to 1941, the idea was known, but there was a guy in, in um, England named Russell Ohl who created the first silicon solar cell in 1941. That solar cell was susceptible to something called reverse bias and extreme heat. So over the next 70 years, the entire solar industry has been focused on solving for this reverse bias that causes extreme heat in solar panels. And by spending a lot of money and focusing on the purity of solar cells and adding lots of complications to the circuitry and the wiring and parts like bypass diodes to a solar panel, the industry has been able to mitigate some of the worst effects of hot spots in solar panels. So on the right, on the right, you see a list of some of the problems uh, facing the solar industry today. And over the last 70 years, we've only been able to solve the first couple. Well, in 2011, uh, Kent Carnahan, my friend and partner, um, invented a way to take the electrons off of a solar panel that does not create reverse bias or heat. And so since 2011, it's been possible now to pre produce solar panels without hot spots, and it solves because of the radical simplification of now the panel architecture that we can deploy, it solves all of these other problems and other problems that I haven't even listed. And we won't go into them because this would be a, a discussion for um, electrical engineering class. So our technology was a little too good to believe. So I talked to some physicist friends of mine at Harvey Mudd. They got excited about it and they took us into their clinic project at, at Harvey Mudd, whereby um, Harvey Mudd College forms partnerships, consulting relationships with industry. And uh, they, they assign teams of five students and a couple professors to solve a problem that a company uh, in the world uh, needs solved. So what we did is work with Harvey Mudd two years ago to test the technology against conventional panels on the left. Ours are on the right. 
in extremely difficult conditions for solar panels to function in. Various orientations, shadows from vent pipes, uh, different times of the day. And we uh, showed through a rigorous side-by-side -side testing that um, our panels uh, dramatically outperformed conventional panels, especially in cloudy and inclement weather, which was interesting. Um, these panels can be delivered and installed with no optimizers or microinverters. And they're going to be, when, they, when, they're, when they're deployed at the end of the year, they will be the first smart panel in the world uh, that can be upgraded as we go forward and learn new ways to manage the, uh, the electrons. So this is the first real world comparison under uh, ex exact uh, rooftop conditions. Cause you know, on a rooftop, all the solar panels aren't necessarily facing in the same way directly south. You sometimes have panels on east, west and south and they all have to interoperate together in that string. More on that later. The unique power of the nonprofit is our second strate strategic advantage. I spent 35 years running a for-profit architecture and construction company. And uh, truth be told, I that whole time kind of thought that nonprofits were a little bit of a scam or a joke. I didn't really quite know what. Um, but I hadn't really looked into the, the business model and the opportunity that uh, the nonprofit business structure in the United States affords us to accomplish things that benefit the commons. And in fact, the nonprofit business model is a, a, a magical and wonderful partnership between government and a local organization who has a good idea that thinks that it will benefit their community. Because this organization can form a nonprofit business model status and get tax relief from the federal and the state government, which allows them to have local investors funnel money rather to, from the, the federal government into a local project run by local people. And the reason the government does this is because it understands that running hyper local, highly targeted projects are way better managed by local organizations than the federal government. And so it's a way to disseminate the opportunity and the leverage for the government to be working on behalf of the people. This is a very beautiful notion. And one of the things that um, uh, I've discovered in doing more reading about this is that there are uh, incredible local resources that are going to waste in every community. And all you need is an organization to help focus those resources to be able to create the necessary means to launch a new project. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here's, here's a cost per watt in a solar panel. You know, it's interesting, a solar panel has very few parts. They're very highly specified and technical in their function, but there really aren't that many parts. When I was building houses, there would be literally tens of thousands of parts on our estimate for uh, a new home, for example. So this is kind of an exciting proposition to me to have 10 or 12 parts um, as a, in a project. So for example, if you add up all the cost of these parts per panel, what you can see is that in manufacturing cost per watt, we can produce a panel at 50 cents per watt or about $150 per panel locally paying full price for all of these materials. The other benefit that we get from our panels is that we don't need what are called microinverters or optimizers. And those cost another 60 to $70 per panel. So the cost of the panel can really be about $210 on the market. Now, as a nonprofit organization, 
And with the technology that we are deploying, we have solved the hotspot problem. The, the, the solar cell manufacturers in the world today are currently in a race to, pre, uh, to, to produce the highest purity solar cell imaginable because every impurity in a solar cell or a micro crack or a shunt will help exacerbate a hotspot problem. And so we're in a problem in the solar industry right now because as the efficiency of cells rise, the problems of hotspots get exacerbated. And so the solar cell industry is forced into more and more purity manufacturing demands. So in the process of producing the most pure, pan, the most pure cells possible, there are always rejects that don't make that purity test. Well, as a nonprofit and also as, as one a company that is totally impervious to the imperfections in solar cells, we can take those solar cells being donated to us by those manufacturers that are worthless to the manufacturer now, but once they donate them to us, they can get a substantial tax write-off based, uh, based on their income statement. So that cost of a solar cell could drop to zero. And there are many other opportunities throughout the solar supply chain that we are open to in terms of taking donations as a nonprofit. So we could get frames for nothing. We could, uh, that which drops the uh, cost per watt down to 35 cents, the cost per panel down to 104. We're also going to, in our factory, uh, have a whole track of volunteers. Um, we're imagining the, the mayors of both Claremont and Pomona coming in and volunteering for a stint in the factory um, as a model for um, the community engagement um, aspect that we are deploying inside the factory. We're imagining neighbors coming in from a neighborhood where we're going to be deploying dozens of solar systems, helping their neighbors create the panels that will go on their homes. So as you can see, there are a number of opportunities for a nonprofit to compete solidly against China even in manufacturing solar. And so one of the things that I've discovered in looking at nonprofit business model is something that I've called now the resource stack. Every community has a resource, a possible suite of resources that could be brought to bear on any particular project. So we've talked about donated materials. There's also donated overhead. For example, we're going to be getting a very steep discount on the utilities and the, and the rental on the property that we will have the factory in. There is idle labor in every community that can be redirected uh, in, in volunteerism. There are idle photons in every community. I threw this in here just to, just to kind of have you all be thinking about the idea of local versus distant photons. As you all know, um, every square meter of the earth receives about a thousand watts of energy a year, every single day. And up till now, our business model has been to sell our intellectual property to countries like China, have them manufacture the cheapest solar panels possible. We send billions of dollars to China to invest in the capital to bring back solar panels and we, we put them up in the desert, uh, ruining the environment and then transporting electrons from the desert to our local communities. And we've now learned, of course, during the mega drought that California is experiencing is that, that not only is it expensive to transport electrons from the desert to Pomona or Claremont, but it's also dangerous because those high voltage lines are creating forest fires in these drought conditions. So not only are we uh, allowing our capital to leave the country, but we're setting up solar in the least efficient method possible in a desert and then jeopardizing our, uh, our environment further by creating forest fires. And we know this is a problem because PG&E is literally bankrupt because of that problem. 
This is a problem of distant photons and not local communities creating local energy resources. We all know that there are idle dollars in every community. If you had an energy investment opportunity in your community that would benefit your neighbors with a guaranteed return based on the difference between what they're paying for energy and what they would be paying with a solar panel, I believe that there will be thousands of people on a small scale willing to make that investment in their local community. So we're working on developing local investment opportunities for our community. We're gonna be attracting new businesses. We're gonna be encouraging anchor businesses like the universities uh, to purchase materials from local companies to keep dollars recirculating. We've got university research and development going on. The, the, Cal pa, I mean the, uh, the Harvey Mudd project that we worked on, uh, we had two clinic projects that were actually donated to us by Harvey Mudd uh, as pro bono projects. They were so excited about what we're doing. Since then, we've hired uh, one of the Harvey Mudd grads uh, as the project manager to help us start up our factory. So as you can see, there are many, many strategies uh, that we can deploy that a for-profit company cannot, including grants and foundation help. So all of those benefits accrue to the bottom line, reducing our cost per panel, allowing us to produce more panels for our neighborhood. So I'm gonna go through this just very quickly and show you uh, the for-profit company is usually owned by a person or entity. Its mission is uh, an individual one and usually about competition and accruing dollars, pure and simple. They have expenses, they have overhead, and then they have a net profit. That net profit accrues back to the person or entity and oftentimes leaves the community entirely. That's actually been our business model in the United States now for the last 60 years, is we have encouraged venture capital to invest in multinational corporations at the expense of jobs in local communities. What we're now learning is that with a nonprofit, you can have several missions, local economic development, jobs, environmental justice, focusing on the charitable class and the community. The nonprofit can be holistic, synergistic, and democratic. And once we deploy all of those uh, resources, we can reduce the cost, compete with China, create more panels, and have more local economic expansion. And then the profits, in those cases, stay in the community because they're reinvested back in the project. That is exactly what we're talking about when we get to the idea of the new localism. This book was being read by the mayor of Pomona and he showed me this book. I went out and had our whole staff read it. The idea is that we need to start thinking more carefully about how we're going to regenerate our local economies rather than continue to have them uh, shrink. Okay, I came across this graph last year, it was um, stunning to me. This is the household income difference by quintile plus the top 5% in 1970. This is the era that I first went to uh, college in. You can see all of the, um, most of the people in the country uh, were not divided by that much income disparity and even the top 5% we're generally making under 50,000 a year. Fast forward to today, from 1970 to today, and what I'm going to contend is that um, the environmental uh, tragedy or tragedies that we're facing in the world today do not just involve the extermination of uh, other species. But I believe that we're in the active engagement of exterminating the lowest 50% of our own species. 
we have completely isolated the lowest 50% of our population from adequate health insurance, adequate food, adequate education, adequate connectivity, and adequate water and environmental opportunity. And so we're now threatening the quality of life of over half of our population. This is, this is kind of the model that, um, or, or the image that I had uh, growing up in Kansas uh, of life uh, and life in Kansas. And this was not too uncommon. Um, we all know uh, what it looks like today. And nobody, I would contend that nobody outside of Monsanto or Dow thinks that this is a good idea. We all know that we've got about 60 more rotations of this kind of farming in the United States before we have killed all of our soil in an irreparable way. So we're not only using petrochemicals, we're not only using fertilizer, we're not only using glyphosate, we're not only using ge uh, genetically modified uh, crops, but we've, we've completely gotten away from a local, rich, nutrient, dense, abundant, and regenerative agriculture and economic outlook. We've got a, a great organization in Claremont called Uncommon Good. This is one of their farmers. They're farming uh, unused land right inside the city. This is a, an organic rice field, hand planted and hand harvested that I visited in China last year. And this is a United States uh, local um, chicken, um, regenerative chicken farm where they're regenerating the land and producing produce. We all know that this is better. In fact, the economists now understand that for China to live, they have to go back now to more rural practices and build up the village rather than the cities. So here's a model. Real quick, here's just a graphic of what I mean by regenerative economy. We have anchor institutions up here, universities, hospitals, for example, major corporations that hire a lot of people and purchase a lot of goods, like solar panels. Then, if a city is smart, they start thinking in terms of local businesses and cooperatives, like a solar panel factory. I think it's always interesting they put smokestacks on a solar panel factory. Um, greenhouses and other sorts of local industry. And then you can form local nonprofit corporations that help fund these local industries supported by the municipal government and these local industries hire the surrounding community. So it's a closed loop and it's a focus on recreating jobs. We now know in terms of community wealth building principles that labor matters more than capital. And also multipliers matter. It matters where you spend that money and who gets the money. So for example, we know that a low income household saving $80 a month on utility bills will tend to spend that $80 locally and immediately at a four to six times higher multiplier rate than a high income household who tends to save or invest that money outside the local community, right? So we're learning to piece together some of these principles as we're trying to develop a more enlightened business practice as we're also fighting global warming because we believe that we need to not only create sustainable energy, but we need to deploy that in a sustainably economic manner. So we're trying to help cities think like a system and act like an entrepreneur in terms of deployment of new technologies and especially around global warming. This is the model, the economic model for how our local communities have been acting over the last 50 years. We've been basically outsourcing all of our goods and services to other people and oftentimes other countries, right? Uh, solar panels being an example, 
many of our dollars are going to Canada, Mexico, Philippines, and China. Our goal at CHIRP is to create a little bit of metaphorical negative pressure from an economic perspective in our region, Claremont Pomona, let's just say, so that we can draw in investment and minimize the leakage out of the local economy. And then if we can deploy businesses that understand how to regenerate dollars and attract more businesses, then we can fill up the local economy with a regenerative um, economic model. So the final piece that I want to talk to you about is poverty and environmental justice. We now know it's all ingrained in our brains uh, through things like Flint, Michigan and thousands and thousands of other communities. Many of them are located right around us in uh, Pomona and um, Ontario. And then we get further into San Bernardino and um, that whole area considered to be the kind of the inland California. Uh, we've, we've now have essentially two Californias, the coastal California and inland California, starting with Fresno and Bakersfield, coming all the way down into San Bernardino, where there is tremendous uh, environmental blight. So we are going to address this issue. It's, it's time to uh, hit this head on. So California has also decided to do that, and they created something called the Cal EnviroScreen map. We're on the third iteration. And if you look at Pomona on the Cal Enviro screen, most of Pomona surrounding, this is Claremont right here, surrounding Claremont, it, most of Pomona is what's bright red. And that is the 91 to 100th highest percentile score for negative environmental impacts in this area. You can click on the census tract and pull up a whole suite of environmental toxins and they've measured that for that particular census tract. It's a wonderful um, uh, tool that you can climb on after we're done and take a look at and play with. Now we have something called uh, Senate Bill 535 um, ushered in by Kevin DeLeon um, who was a Pitzer grad. Um, on top of the Cal Enviro screen and 535 um, earmarks uh, money to be spent on disadvantaged communities. So under the Cal Enviro screen map, 25% of all disadvantaged, uh, of all of the money that's being generated in cap and trade, um, which is over a billion dollars a year, must be earmarked and spent in disadvantaged communities. And there's another assembly bill called AB 1550 that earmarks another 10% for low income. So we are in process of doing everything we can to get some of those billions of dollars focused on the inland empire in our, in our so-called disadvantaged communities. And this is the factory um, that we're moving into. We're currently designing the floor plan. We have just uh, ordered um, all of our machinery, which should be arriving at the Port of Los Angeles in about four weeks. No, it, it'll be leaving in about four weeks and it'll be arriving in about four weeks after that. So we expect to have solar panels uh, being made for UL approval uh, over the summer and have panels ready for distribution, both to cities, schools, neighborhoods, but especially to low income households by the end of the year. And we would like to, I'd like to maybe just open up uh, the conversation. I've probably spoken for way too long. Um, and I'd love to hear any questions or comments. And I'd like you to know that if you're interested in volunteering in any capacity, uh, we would love to have you as, as uh, uh, in, in, involved with us. So. Okay. So Devin, um, current question right now is, where are the raw materials for panel production sourced? And who are the base level suppliers for things like steel, 
and are any products other than solar panels required to put these plants in motion? Um, the materials are being sourced from all over the world right now. Um, and we're working out all of the, uh, the tariff issues. That's one of, the, one of the sticky things right now in this particular environment, working with duties and tariffs. And um, we will be uh, having all of those materials delivered. We will not be actually manufacturing materials. We will be assembling uh, those materials th that we purchase uh, into uh, solar panels uh, in the factory. I got another question here. Um, I'd like to know if the panels can hook into a grid tie inverter to feed electricity to your house. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry for the interpreter. Could you repeat that question, please? Absolutely. The question was, I'd like to know if the panels can hook into a grid tie inverter to feed electricity into your house. That's a great question. And yes, absolutely. We're, ma we're making these for uh, all UL approved um, um, opportunities. Okay, another question. Um, will you be talking about the price, the affordability of these panels and the installation costs? Um, we won't be talking about it today. Um, but we certainly will be talking about it when we get closer to uh, production. Um, but suffice it to say that um, every indication is that it will be um, less expensive than purchasing from China. Um, and um, we are intent on deploying solar panels for the lowest income households for, for free for them. That's our business model. Our business model is <coughs> diverting money from the state in cap and trade projects to allow low-income households to divert their money into the local economy. And for a $25 million investment that would create 6,000 low-income households with, uh, with um, uh, renewable energy, that would generate enough sales tax revenue back to the state to pay back that $25 million so to speak, payback, it's a, it's a revenue, it's a revenue uh, expanded to a gained uh, proposition uh, in under uh, five years and, and double their money in under 10. And another question, how has COVID-19 affected your timeline? Yeah, great question. Um, we are a startup company. Uh, we're not manufacturing yet, so we didn't have to shut down uh, a manufacturing company. Uh, we've been working online now for the last couple of years, so we're basically working 110%. Um, I think it slowed down our timeline by about two months uh, because of the negotiations uh, around the world uh, uh, bogged down. And we were also concerned, obviously, about China and shipping routes. Uh, so, but that, that seem, we've seen to be past that at this point. And so I think all in all, we've been, uh, we've been stopped about two, two and a half months. Okay, I have another question. Um, is there a student internship? Stu uh, we, right now we have uh, 38 uh, student interns working with us um, in a political science class from Pomona College and also um, an environmental class from Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, they are working really hard on various subcommittees accomplishing really uh, wonderful things for us. So we have a long history of student engagement with CHIRP um, and, a, and a very um, uh, wonderful history of um, uh, accomplishing uh, a lot with our student interns um, while they're with us, they, they give us a lot. And I, and I like to think that we give them some, some great opportunities. What would it take for students to be a part of that internship? Okay, send a request to info at chirp.net, C-H-E-R-P.net. 
and just put in the subject line uh, volunteer or student intern and include your CV or your bio and we will get back to you. That's fantastic. We'd love to have some applications. One of our student groups right now is designing our entire professional volunteer track program uh, that will be being launched in about a month. And you can check on our website for that. And our website is uh, chirplgp.org. Okay, another question. If you can use donated cells, which are an existing technology, what do you add to the technology to solve that long list of technical problems you showed on the slide? Okay, that's really great. Um, the solar cell itself um, is uh, not what's being changed. What's being changed is the way the electrons are being taken off the strings of cells on the panel. There's a problem, um, as you know, well, if you all remember the idea of when you, when you used to take batteries out of a flashlight, at least, at least when I was a kid, every now and then I'd leave my flashlight for too long and I'd take the batteries out and one of them was kind of exploded and mushroomed. That's a problem, that, that's, a, that's a cell as well. And that cell became a little bit weaker than its neighbors and its neighbors forced their energy in a condition called reverse bias through that cell, that weak cell, and created a tremendous amount of heat and melted the, the, the battery actually. And that's what, what happens in solar cells. So Kent Kernahan went back to Einstein's original calculations, believe it or not, and saw a new relationship that nobody had seen before because Einstein was not creating solar cells, right? He was figuring out uh, the general uh, law of the photoelectric effect, stripping electrons off of photons. And he discovered uh, a new relationship between current and voltage uh, that could be uh, managed in a different way. And he literally just made reverse bias an impossibility in a solar panel. I have another question here. Um, would they be interested in working with our solar installation tech certificate students? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I was in touch um, uh, several months back uh, with a couple people from that department and I forget who they were, a couple really nice, let's see here. I can look up maybe their names, uh, but I'm very, very interested in that kind of a, uh, a relationship. Um, yeah, I think it was uh, Tammy Pearson from the Career Education and Workforce Center. Uh, and yes, uh, I'm, we are very open to that. Uh, we have a whole committee on uh, workforce development experts uh, for the region uh, in San Gabriel Valley here. And uh, we would love, um, it's probably now time to kind of re-enliven uh, re that conversation with Mount SAC. We envision hiring probably at least 100 people to be helping deploy uh, solar panels in the region. Okay, another question. Is there a list available of subcontractors providing materials being assembled? And is CHIRP only going to remain focused on photovoltaic solar or will they expand their focus over time? Um, we do have a list of, um, we're developing that list of uh, the bill of materials, the vendors, uh, from whom we're purchasing uh, materials, uh, if that's what you mean. Uh, there'll be a, uh, another short list of uh, materials for construction, uh, the wiring, um, the, um, uh, the piping, uh, and, some, and sometimes the structures uh, for parking lots. Um, but for right now, 
Um, we are interested in manufacturing um, uh, solar panels only, but we're also trying to bring the manufacturing of the things like the junction boxes on the back of those panels and also the controller cards, the electronics, we want to also bring in house. So we're talking right now with uh, some workforce development experts in uh, intellectually uh, and physically disabled workshops uh, to help us put together some of these electronics, which can be done uh, very handily uh, and expertly by uh, people on the spectrum. Thank you. Um, another question. In light of recent news regarding oil prices plummeting and with storage spaces becoming scarce, would you say that more countries now see the vices of oil and switch to solar? Well, I think um, it's inevitable um, as solar prices drop. And now as we show the world that solar can be produced not only in billion dollar lights out fully automated factories in China, but they could be produced in your city or in a coal miner's city or in any other uh, economically disadvantaged um, area of our country. Um, that I, I, think, I, I think the fossil fuel industry knows, I mean, it, 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 it will have a, a significant role to play for some time, uh, but I think they do know that um, ultimately speaking, um, they're going to have to figure out uh, an exit plan. I have another question here. I'm interested in the project, but I live in a neighboring city. Understandably, the project is made to mainly benefit the cities they're based in. I would like to know the benefits or services people from neighboring cities could possibly access through their assistance. So in the beginning, if, if it's literally a neighboring city, in the beginning, we can uh, supply that city with panels um, and maybe even hire some people from that city. Um, if it's two or three cities over and we want to start another factory, then uh, people on this call or people you know um, may want to help us form what we're calling core energy groups in these other potential cities to create their own factory. Um, and we're getting ready to, um, our, our goal is to have two more factories beyond Pomona in process by the end of this year. Uh, we're, we're talking with uh, Compton, we're talking with Victorville, we're talking with San Bernardino, uh, we're talking with Pasadena. Um, so uh, we are very interested in engaging with uh, other cities who might want to uh, seriously consider this. Um, it looks like maybe some folks also posted questions to your chat specifically because I know that um, both Lonnie and I have been getting questions, but there may be some that went directly to you, Devin. So maybe you want to look. Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, Linda just said that she sent this question to you, but I do have a couple more questions here. Um, is your process patent or is it open? The technology is patented. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, in the public record um, and it cannot be uh, deployed uh, outside of the United States. It can only de de be deployed in uh, a, a nonprofit business model inside of local municipalities. And I have another question. Um, can you share what some of the student interns are working on right now so that uh, some of our students may be interested in joining? I'm sorry, say that again. I'm trying to figure out how to get back to my chat. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, can you share what some of the current student interns are working on now? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, one of the groups is, is uh, coordinating and planning and creating our professional volunteer track. Um, as you can imagine, that's a, that's a fairly big task. We're identifying all of the volunteer positions in the, in the organization. And then we're uh, also creating a landing page and a, an application process and a training process on, on site, uh, online. 
Uh, one of the other groups is a, an, a, an economic analysis group. Um, there are uh, programs, uh, fairly robust programs, like uh, RIMS2, uh, the REMI model, uh, and M-Plan, that uh, are, are called uh, input-output regional economic uh, models. And so you can dial in some fairly sophisticated inputs to get some fairly uh, robust outputs showing the economic advantages of starting a solar factory in your particular region and what the positive economic shocks are that accrue to that region uh, from that uh, employment and the deployment of the panels. Um, we also have uh, a community outreach um, uh, group uh, working on co uh, connecting with uh, churches and, and homeowners uh, and creating uh, projects for us once we have the panels going. Um, ju and just a number of, uh, we also have a political um, uh, science group researching uh, cap and trade and other legislation in the state of California. Uh, that are um, that focused on helping uh, promote the kind of things that we're doing. So I got a, a question from uh, Linda. Uh, Linda, you said you really liked the idea of the new localism. Um, I, would, I would recommend you get that book called The New Localism. It's a great read. Um, and then there's another uh, website called uh, community-wealth.org. Um, that's a that's a great website. Um, there's something on there called the Cleveland model. Uh, there's a bunch of graphics and uh, videos around this whole idea of uh, new localism. Um, and yes, I did uh, start this company um, with my own money, uh, funded it uh, until the point at which I started being funded by um, ver various counties, uh, Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, Yolo County uh, to do some of my energy efficiency work. And this factory is being launched now um, as a budget item in uh, the state uh, budget for uh, 2019. Um, our assemblyman um, lobbied uh, the legislature for $2.1 million to start this factory. So uh, we, are, we have backing by the, by the state of California to do this. Oh, okay. Somebody was asking if you could please repeat the email address for sending um, the, um, of if you want to do a student internship. Yes. It's info, I-N-F-O at chirp, C-H-E-R-P dot net. And um, any questions that you have, um, any uh, possibilities of, uh, of an interest in, um, coming to, to work with us, just let us know. Uh, we, we collect every one of these, we'll get back to you uh, and have a conversation with you. And, and we welcome everybody. Um, we have, you know, we have um, uh, government professors, uh, we have physicists, we have electrical engineers, um, uh, we have our uh, former, the former mayor of Claremont, uh, we have uh, business people, um, we've got the, our, our, assembly, uh, our assembly person uh, for the 41st district. We have uh, lots and lots of people on our board of advisors and uh, people who are helping us in, in various committee work. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting and it's a, it's a wonderful kind of cross section of the community. And uh, we're incredibly committed to uh, working with students. We feel like it's, it, every university right now is, is, is trying to find meaningful uh, engagement uh, with with students uh, in their community that that uh, translates back into the academic work, and you know we we do projects uh, having to do with poly, uh, political science, uh, with physics, with uh, 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 electrical engineering, um, now manufacturing, um, uh, community outreach, marketing, um, uh, in, environmental analysis. There's just, there's almost kind of anything you can imagine uh, we've got students working on. Okay, I have another question. Are you worried about future competition from companies who are on track to develop molten salt reactors 
and small modular reactors within the next tw 10 to 20 years? Uh, we're hoping for um, any kind of energy innovation. Um, the technology that we're deploying right now, um, the research and development opportunities now that we've taking, taken heat out of solar panel afford us the opportunity as well uh, to leapfrog a lot of the old technology. So we're expecting that in another four years, we'll probably have a, a solar panel that can produce uh, twice the energy that they're producing today um, with, um, uh, z uh, with zero safety concerns. Uh, solar panels today are burning, uh, burning up and burning down buildings. You probably all saw the, um, the Walmart suit against Tesla uh, six months back. Um, those, uh, the, they have seven of their buildings catch on fire uh, because of hotspots. You can just Google that and see uh, amazing pictures uh, about that. So uh, the panels that we're deploying today are, are early technology and they're not fully baked. Uh, what we're going to be deploying is uh, radically uh, simplified, will be radically uh, more energy productive and radically uh, safer than what we've been experience, uh, experiencing today. So I'm, I'm hoping for um, all technologies um, to uh, explode in the next 10 years. I'm sorry I came to the conversation a little bit late, Devin. Um, it's really interesting what you're saying though. You're not using silicon wafers, it doesn't sound like. And we I are. was wondering if you could, oh, you are? Yeah, okay. we're using conventional, right now we're using conventional silicon um, uh, created for conventional panels. It's just that our, our panel uh, uh, electronics prevents any of those cells from entering re reverse bias, prevents it. We've eliminated that problem. So we're not just, okay. we're not just mitigating hotspots with bypass diodes and multiple string architecture and those kinds of um, uh, workarounds. We now, we now are going to deploy a solar panel with quarter cells, 260 of them, all in one string, no bypass diodes. And then ultimately what this will do, uh, of course, is allow us to uh, create a whole industry to simplify uh, the silicon um, uh, cell, because uh, it doesn't have to be as pure um, as they do now to avoid the hotspot problem, as, as efficient as they're getting. Yeah, but just, just, just so everybody knows, um, this, you know, just the technology is a, is a fantastic two hour conversation. And so uh, we're, we're glad to follow up with any of you uh, who might be interested um, in that conversation. I, I would be curious about that. Okay, that's fantastic. All right, um, so I have a, another question. Can a link to a white paper or US patent be provided for the technology mentioned? Okay, go to idealpv dot com you will see the patent and all of the information and especially um, in terms of the uh, deployment manual you'll see a side-by-side -side comparison of some of the technology uh, but the proof uh, the proof and the patent um, are, are right there on the website it's a great great place to start So I have no more questions right now. Lonnie, any more? Uh, no, I, I would just say if for some reason I miss your question, please resend it because I think that's all I have. I've received a couple of um, email addresses for folks asking for the recording. So um, please again, send either to Lonnie or myself your email address if you would like to get a recording of this presentation at a later time. Um, before we, we let Devin uh, go um, and everybody leaves for today, um, I, I really want to thank you again so, so much for your time and the amazing work that you are doing. Um, it's, it's so beautiful to see. Um, really salute you. This is fantastic. Um, thank you so I, much. It's a community effort. 